all of you. Good morning, Father. In the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 10, God instructed Moses to construct out of acacia wood the holy ark of the covenant as his throne. It was to measure two and a half cubits long by one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. Now, as you can see behind our altar, we now have a new Ark of the Covenant tabernacle, and it's the exact same size as the original Ark built by Moses. Now, two local craftsmen here from San Pedro spent about four months working on this, and they did, I think they did a great job. I think it's really beautiful. What do you guys think? Maybe we should give them a hand, right? I think we should give them a hand. In the future, I will be teaching you a lot more about the depth of its symbolism and also our significance. I'll do that a little bit today. Now, God gifted us with this new tabernacle right before the Feast of Pentecost. And this is very significant. Very significant because on Pentecost, each of the disciples became like a new tabernacle. And God's fire started burning inside of them. And it's precisely this inner fire that God himself wants to rekindle in you this Pentecost. Now, last Easter Sunday on April the 9th, we began a 49-day countdown that leads to the Feast of Pentecost on day number 50. Today is the 50th day after Easter. Today is Pentecost. Now, for the Jewish people, Pentecost was actually a harvest festival known in Hebrew as Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, because it happens seven weeks after the Passover. Yet the Jewish, in Jewish tradition, Pentecost was actually memorialized what happened on Mount Sinai. What happened on Mount Sinai? Well, first, let me show you a, a picture because 14 years ago on this month, May of 2009, I had the privilege of leading a pilgrimage to Mount Sinai. Check out this picture of me celebrating mass at the foot of Mount Sinai. That's Mount Sinai right behind me over there on top. And on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on two tablets. And those tablets were kept inside of the Ark of the Covenant that was built on Mount Sinai along with a, few, a couple other things. Now, on Mount Sinai, God also made a marriage covenant with the Israelites. And the Lord came down on this mount in the form of a divine fire. And the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 12, says that God actually spoke audibly to them from the midst of this fire, and it scared them all, and he promised not to do it again. In addition, the Israelites constructed, like, next to the ark, a tent of meeting in which they put the ark, and then a table of, br of bread, then a menorah with seven torch lights, and then a veil, and then finally an altar. And upon this altar... The Levitical priests were instructed to keep a fire burning perpetually 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Why? Because this fire was holy. Because it was God's presence in their midst. And this is why we always keep a perpetual fire burning with a candle next to the tabernacle. Because God's presence is here. His holy presence is here. The only time we don't have the, the Holy Eucharist here is Good Friday. Outside of that, his presence is here. And the fire is always there. That's my job. My job is to keep that fire going. Your job is to keep the fire going in, in here. Now, based on Exodus 35.3, the Jewish people, even today, are not permitted to start a new fire on Saturday, the Sabbath. For example, Orthodox Jews don't even light an oven. They have to pay somebody to do it. Or they don't even light a match on Saturday. Why? Because for them, starting a fire is like considered work. It was like considered an act of creation. Yet what if a new fire is started by God himself? Then that fire becomes something very holy, something divine, something sacred. Because God himself is creating something new, a new fire. That's exactly what happened on Pentecost. It was a divine act. It was a new creation, a new fire. Now that said, turn with me to the, second, to the first reading today, which comes from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4 that says this. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together, like this, 
And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as a fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's stop there. So on, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit first manifests like a rushing wind. And then a blaze of fire appeared above them. And then separating into individual flames, it rained down perhaps like a shower of sparks dropping, you know, from like a firework. And this indicated that the Holy Spirit came to rest on them. And that means he came to dwell inside of each one of them. And each one of them became, you could say, a new tabernacle of God. They became a new house for God. Now our new Ark of the Covenant Tabernacle, it's supposed to represent your heart. It's your heart that this represents. There in your heart is where God wants the inner fire of the Holy Spirit to burn brightly. There in your heart is where he wants to rest. Now your, my job is to keep that candle burning 24-7 while the presence of God is there. Your job as a baptized Christian is to keep this inner fire burning brightly and perpetually in your heart 24-7, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's why today, after this Mass at 10 a.m., after the 7 p.m. Mass, we will be giving all the baptized Catholics an opportunity to reaffirm the grace of their baptism in our baptismal pool. It's not a new baptism. We're not going to use a baptismal formula. A person is only baptized once. And I'll explain a lot more about theology of baptism during that period. Yet it is a wonderful and powerful reaffirmation of your original baptism. What for? Well, to ask the Holy Spirit to rekindle that inner fire that started on the day that you were baptized, perhaps a long time ago. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, the church added about 3,000 new persons that were baptized that day. And so this is like the perfect day to ask the Holy Spirit to rekindle the inner fire of all the baptized. Now, Acts chapter 2, verse 4 said this, and they were all filled with who? The Holy Spirit. I like the word filled. You know, there's a difference between having the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, each one of us received the Holy Spirit in our soul from the moment that we were what? Baptized. For example, in today's second reading, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Word of God says this, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. You see, so every Christian has the Holy Spirit within them from the moment that they were baptized into the mystical body of of Christ. Yet not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a difference. The phrase filled with the Holy Spirit actually is used in several different places in the New Testament. For example, two chapters later, in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible says, as they prayed, the place where they were gathered shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this happened way after Pentecost. In other words, they were filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, yet they were refilled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4. So that means that we can be filled and refilled and refilled, you know, by the Holy Spirit many times. And the beautiful thing is that the Holy Spirit gives us free refills, free refills. I'm not sure if the restaurants here in San Pedro give refills, but God does. God gives free refills. You see, God actually designated and designed us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In heaven, you will be completely filled and perpetually filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you are filled with the Holy Spirit here on earth, you actually begin to bring heaven to earth. You become like a little taste of heaven. You become a new tabernacle of God. You see, if you want to experience God's love, the Holy Spirit is indispensable. I mean, if you want to fulfill God's plan for your life and all the gifts and, and, and gifts that he has given you, you need to be filled with 
the Holy Spirit. For example, imagine if one day you purchase a brand new, super expensive golf cart. I mean, this thing, man, is loaded with all the gadgets. I was asking around, how much does a golf cart cost? They were real expensive. They said like $30,000. And I said, oh my God. Imagine a golf cart that's like $50,000. I mean, this thing is like gold or something. And the next day, you get on your golf cart, you turn the key, press the accelerator, and nothing happens. And you keep trying and does it, nothing is working. Man, and you get yourself when you call the dealership all upset. Man, you sold me a piece of junk. I paid so expensive, it won't even start. And the salesperson, after a few questions, then finally asks you, can you do me a favor? Can you check the gas tank? Have you checked the gas tank? And then, you know, you look at the little arrow, says the E, but to be on the safe side, you open up the, the seat, check the gas tank, and effectively, it is totally empty, vacío, nada. You see, for as expensive as a new golf cart could be, for as much horsepower or as gadgets it might have, if there is no fuel in the gas tank, it won't, it's not going to work, it won't go anywhere. The same with us and with our spiritual life. God purchased you at a very high price, the blood of Jesus. We just celebrated his resurrection 50 days ago. And at your baptism, you were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit into literally a new creation. A beloved daughter and a beloved son of God. That's your identity from God himself. And that's an identity that transcends even death itself. That identity will last forever. Now, but you still need to fill the gas tank with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, the grace of the Holy Spirit is that indispensable fuel that makes your new redeemed nature as a child of God work. The grace of the Holy Spirit is the fuel that makes your marriages, your families, your relationships, your ministries work the way they're supposed to work designed by God. For example, imagine your marriage ain't working so good, and you're a little upset at God, and one day, you know, you're praying with God, and, and you say, Lord God, this marriage ain't working out. Lord, you sold me a defective product, and it was really expensive. Now, you know what God's going to probably ask you or respond? Have you checked the gas tank? Have you checked the gas tank? Because if your gas tank is on empty, they don't expect the marriage to run the way that God designed it to run. Now imagine that both of you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Then that marriage is going to be amazing. In fact, it's going to be a little taste of, of heaven. Of heaven. Because you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit as you will in heaven. Now do me a favor then. Ask the person next to you. Have you checked the gas tank? Can you ask the person next to you like that? Have you checked the gas tank lately? Have you checked the gas tank lately? <laughs> now, you might be running on empty, man. You might be, I don't know. So I have a question. What would your life look like if you were filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer is actually sort of simple. Your life would demonstrate the gifts of the Holy Spirit and manifest the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at both of these. Who can remember how many gifts the Holy Spirit there are? There are seven gifts. The prophet Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 forward gives us a list of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Please repeat them after me. Wisdom. Wisdom. Understanding. Understanding. Knowledge. Knowledge. Counsel. Counsel. Fortitude. Fortitude. Piety. And fear, of the Lord. and fear of the Lord. Actually, the door of our new tabernacle has designed in it these seven gifts. Let me take advantage to explain a little bit of the door. Can you check? Could you place the picture of a zoom of the door right there on the, up there? There you go. So there is a picture of the doors. And you could see there, first of all, there's an oval design that has 12 stars around. It stands for the 12 stars, the 12 tribes of Israel stands for the 12 apostles, stands also for the crown of 12 stars around Our Lady's, our, our, her crown in Book of Revelation. And in the middle, 
It has a large cross. Why? Because that is our, 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 our gift of redemption through the cross. But if you look at the top right of the cross, there is a chalice and a host above it that represents the Eucharist, which was, a prefigure, which was the fulfillment of the manna. Now, at the bottom right, you'll see a big M. The M stands for Mary at the foot of the cross. And it's in the same design as the pontifical lo logo of John Paul II. Now, at the bottom, at the top left, excuse me, you can see the dove of the Holy Spirit with the, semi, the seven flames descending, representing the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, right below that, at the bottom left, is the seven candle torches, or seven candle, the Jewish people call it menorah. The Jewish people also nickname it the light of the world, because that candle is supposed to represent you. You should be on fire with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's supposed to be an image of you. That tabernacle is an image of your heart. Whenever you look at the tabernacle, you say, that's the way my heart should be. Now, the New Testament actually lists many types of spiritual gifts. Those were from the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there's a whole bunch of spiritual gifts that we call charisms. So what is a charism? Well, let's go to today's second reading. It tells us this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 7. And I'll summarize it by qu quoting this. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, charisms or, or special gifts are manifestations of the Spirit that are not for your own good. They are for the common good. For example, I believe I have one of my charisms is a charism of teaching. That's why I'm up here teaching. I love to teach. Or, for example, Miss Ancida, I think she has a charism of music. That's why she's up there blessing us with her music. Or if you know some of the others, you have, all of us baptized have certain gifts that God has given you, charisms. But the charisms are not a gift for you. It's a gift for the people that God wants to reach through you. The Holy Spirit empowers you to use these gifts also like to serve in a ministry so you can put them at the service of others. Now this brings me to next weekend. Next weekend on Sunday, June the 4th, we will have a ministry fair from 8 a.m., to 12 noon, just four hours. And our goal is for every member of the church to serve in one ministry here at the church or in one mission locally, nationally, or internationally. Here is what we're asking you to do today. Continue to prayerfully read the list of ministries that we gave you last weekend, or you could find them at the entrance of the church, and ask our Lord Jesus, where he has gifted you to serve. Where the Holy Spirit has gifted you to serve. The next Sunday, you'll be able to talk to someone about the ministries that you might be interested in. And then you can sign up for like a one-time service experience. You're not like signing up forever in blood, no. Just a one-time experience. And if you do that, I think you will discover the joy of serving in God's family by using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to make a difference in other people's lives. Now, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will also begin to produce spiritual fruits in your life. Now, traditionally, there are how many fruits? Twelve fruits. And the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit are, now you can raise your hand if you feel that you need this one, love. love. Could you repeat after me? Love. Love. Joy. Peace. Peace, patience, patience. I need that one, okay. kindness. kindness, I'm getting better at that one, generosity, generosity. faithfulness, faithfulness. Gentleness. gentleness, self control, self -control. who needs that one, that's a big one guys, goodness, goodness. Modesty. modesty, chastity, chastity. boy that's needed here in San Pedro. Big time. Now, the, the 12 fruits of the Spirit demonstrate your spiritual maturity. If you have all of these operating all the time, that means you're filled completely with the Holy Spirit. But I don't know about you, but sometimes my joy is like a half tank. And sometimes my kindness and my patience are like totally empty, zero. 
and I need to refill the, the gas tank. And I realize, you know, that when I'm not praying, immediately it starts consuming all the grace. And I got to come back and, and refill the gas tank. So who needs more of the Holy Spirit in your life? Anybody here? Raise your hand. Who needs to maybe refill the gas tank? I certainly do. So I'll ask you two questions. Do you wish to invite the Holy Spirit to fill you with his grace? Yes or yes? Yes. yes. I don't give you an option. Do you want to love and obey Jesus? Yes or yes? Yes. So let's pray together. If you wish, you can repeat after me. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I know you are my Savior. I know you are my Savior. And I also know that I have seen sin grievously. And I also know to know I that I have sinned grievously. Please forgive me and restore me to your grace. Please forgive me and restore me to your grace. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Come move over us. Come move over us. Come and rest on us. Come and fill us up with your love and glory. And fill, fill us, us up, up with your love and, and glory. that I may experience your presence and love. That I may experience the presence of your love. That I may find new life in prayer. That I may find new life in prayer. That I may find new meaning in the Bible. That I may find new meaning in the Bible. That I may be empowered with your gifts. That I may be empowered with your gifts. To serve in your kingdom. And be holy. And be holy. As you are holy. As you are holy. Amen. Amen. Come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in thy hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill our hearts which thou hast made. To fill our hearts, which thou hast made. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end.